All right, here's where I want to start, and I feel like I should start with an apology, which when you're a communicator is the last thing you want to do, is start with something that people aren't going to like. But I'm about to do it, and I'm apologizing up front, because I want to start by giving you a pop quiz. And I don't know if you were like me, but I hated pop quizzes when I was in school, and here I am doing it to you. The good news is there's no grade for this, okay, so you'll be good. But here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you four statements, and they are all true or false statements, all right? So you got a 50-50 shot. That's for those of you who didn't pass math, that's what that means. So you got a 50-50 shot at it, all right? And what I want you to do is this. I'm going to give you the statement, and then I want you to turn to someone near you, and I want you to tell them what you think your answer would be. So you can turn to the person next to you. If you don't know that person, introduce yourself. If you don't want to talk to the person next to you, turn the other way. Introduce yourself over there, okay? Um, but I'm going to give you these four statements. We'll see how everybody does. You ready? Okay, that was better in first service when somebody actually shouted no. So at least y'all were all quiet. Y'all, I got the mic. I'm going to do it anyway. Y'all don't have to participate. Here's the, here's the first one. True or false, conflict is inevitable in relationships. All right, turn to somebody and tell them if you think it's true or false. Go. Okay, okay. Number two, conflict is unhealthy for relationships. True or false? Go ahead. Tell somebody around you what you think. Okay. Number three. The best relationships have little conflict. True or false? Go ahead. Some of you already need to get in counseling. Three questions in. I'm real, I'm real sorry because y'all aren't on the same page with anything. Number four, resolving conflict requires courage. True or false? Go ahead. Okay. All right. Now, I want to go back through these, and I'll give you my opinion of what the answer is, and you may disagree with me. Uh, but I'm up here, so I'll give you my opinion, and there's actually a little research, I think, to back all of these up. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. We'll see how you did. So conflict is inevitable in relationships. That is absolutely true, isn't it? It's just true. If, if you have a relationship that doesn't have any conflict, one of you is not being honest about anything because it's just part of it, isn't it? And there's some research that came out recently um, on the backside here of COVID. They did some studies with people around conflict. And, you know, there's a lot of debate about, you know, do you go back to work or do you keep working from home? People have different opinions. Well, they did, they did some research around all this, and here's what they found. 85%, 85% of all people who are in the workplace say they experience at least some level of conflict at work. That is not surprising, is it? I'm curious if the other 15% work by themselves because I'm like, you go in your workplace, you're going to deal with conflict at some point. It just happens, doesn't it? Here was the other thing that I thought was really interesting. So they went and surveyed romantic couples, all right? And 84% of those couples said that they experienced moderate levels of conflict, at least, in their relationship. The other 16% have an inability to tell the truth. That's what you call that. Because you don't... You can't. You just can't be in a relationship without there being conflict. Now, the reason I bring this up is because some of you grew up in homes, and I get this, or you, know, you were taught conflict is bad, conflict is bad, conflict is bad. So you try to avoid it at all costs. Some of you are wired where you don't want to deal with conflict. I'm, I'm not one of those people. I don't mind having a difficult conversation. But, but some of you are wired, you just don't want to. So anytime there's conflict in any relationship, you know, in neighborhood, at work, you just, you just get so nervous, you know, you feel like, oh, no, things are terrible. I must have done something wrong. No, no, it's just normal. It's natural. Conflict is inevitable. Which leads us to number two, conflict's unhealthy for relationships, and this is where you flip it on its head, because that's actually not true. Now, the way you respond, the way you handle, the way you approach conflict can be healthy or unhealthy, but conflict in and of itself is not unhealthy. As a matter of fact, conflict in and of itself can actually be a really good thing. It can be a positive thing. Research has found that if two people both know how to handle conflict in a healthy way, that conflict will actually draw you closer together. It doesn't push you further apart. Which leads to number three, the best relationships have little conflict. Well, that's actually false as well. Here's, here's the deal. If you're in a relationship, and there's probably an exception to this rule, so you can live under the exception if this is you. But if, in general, if you're in a relationship where there's never any conflict, it just means somebody's not telling the truth. It just means somebody doesn't feel the freedom to express themselves and their opinions because you don't agree with everybody on anything, do you? There are always going to be some issues come up. So what they have found is this, that the best relationships are not the ones that have the least amount of conflict. The best relationships are actually usually the ones who have significant conflict 
that is just handled in a really healthy way. Which means two people in the relationship both feel the freedom to be honest and to be open and to share their perspectives because they have enough trust there and enough safety there to know, okay, we can disagree and we can work through it. And that actually makes the best relationships. Which leads us to number four, resolving conflict requires courage. Well, that is absolutely true. It does. You know this because you're like me. You've been in these situations where there's something you've just been trying to avoid. There's an issue you just didn't want to deal with. And you know how much courage it takes to approach somebody, to have a conversation, to dive into an issue when there's uncertainty around how it will turn out. You get that. It does require a lot of courage. More on that in just a minute. So last week we started this series, this short three-part series called Relationship Wreckers and the Three Skills to Defeat Them. And the goal of this series is, one, to help us understand Jesus taught the quality of our lives is determined by the quality of our relationships. And so what we're trying to do is not identify the behaviors that wreck relationships. I mean, that's fine. That's level one. But when you identify a behavior, you can try to modify your behavior, but it actually doesn't change what's driving your behavior. So what we're trying to do is actually identify the attitudes behind the behaviors, the attitudes that are often in your heart and in my heart, you know, We don't even realize they're there sometimes, but they are driving us to do some things that damage or in some cases eventually destroy or wreck the relationships that we have. And today we're going to talk, uh, jump into and discuss this second attitude. Relationship record number two is this. The attitude that being right is more important than making the relationship right. Being right is more important than making the relationship right. Now, when I say that, here's my guess. My guess is you can immediately think of somebody who operates that way. You can think of somebody in your life that they just always have to be right, and you get the feeling, you get the impression, and they might might not admit this, but you get the impression that they value being right way more than they value the relationship with you. And if they have to burn down the relationship to prove they're right, well, in the end, that's exactly what they would do. All of us have known people like that, and we know how devaluing it feels to be on the other side of it. Well, this is an attitude that's just an expression of unhealthy conflict. That's all it is. This is what unhealthy conflict looks like. Now, all of us can think of people like that, but here's the thing I would pretty much guarantee, I would bet money that none of you thought of yourself when I brought that up because we don't see ourselves this way, do we? We just see other people. And yet this attitude can creep into our relationships and it's felt by the people on the other side of us but we never know we're actually doing it. We, we've got good reasons. We've got justification for why we're responding the way we're responding when in reality, we just care a lot more about being right than we do valuing or making the relationship right. So I want to give you a couple signs of what unhealthy conflict looks like. A couple things that if you catch yourself doing these, it'll cause you to pause. It causes me to pause and go, uh-oh, I don't think I'm approaching this conflict in the right way. The first sign is this. You have imaginary arguments with the person in your head, in your mind. Any of you ever do this? I love this. This is a lot of fun. It is. It's a lot of fun because I am undefeated in imaginary arguments in my mind. This is why I love it so much because I want to win. And every argument I have in my mind with somebody, I come out a winner, and I go ahead and invite a crowd of people to watch because I would like for there to be witnesses to go, that was a brilliant case, Matt. You are so right. You've done this too, haven't you? You get so upset with somebody over something, but you won't talk to them about it. You know, you just argue with them in your head over and over. Anytime I catch myself, anytime you catch yourself, having these imaginary conversations or arguments in your mind, it ought to cause you to pause and go, okay, wait a minute. I think I'm approaching this conflict in an unhealthy way. I actually think right now I care way more about being right than I do making that relationship right. Now, the other one is somewhat related It's just a little more public. The second sign is this, that you talk about the person to other people. Okay, here's what I mean by that. I don't mean, you know, all of us have a a core small group of, you know, friends, of family, whoever it is that we just do life and process life with. So sometimes something happens, you want to sit down with your best friend and just unpack it. And that's that's all fine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this habit that all of us or this behavior that all of us can fall into where so-and-so made us mad. And so we don't mind sharing that with all kinds of other people that we run into. You, you've experienced this, right? You've been on the other side of this, and you've been guilty of this. So have I. There is a word for it. The word is gossip. That's what, that's what it is. That's all it is. It's just gossip. So gossip is when you talk about a person with someone who's neither a part of the problem or the solution. You didn't help create the problem. 
You have nothing, no way you can help solve the problem. I just want to get it off my chest, so I'm going to tell you all about what so-and-so did. Now, what would drive us to do that? Well, here's my theory. When I find myself doing that, I'm usually doing it because I'm looking for someone to validate that I'm right and or I'm looking to be seen by other people as right in the conflict. Again, it's all about me being right. It's all about me being right. And you know this, you've done this too. If, if somebody, you know, if I go to you and I talk to you about it and you don't validate that I'm right, I'm just not going to talk to you about it anymore. I'm going to go to the next person and you'll talk to 10 people until you find one that tells you you're right and then it's like, I knew it, I knew it, you know. What about the other nine that said you're wrong? Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. That guy is smart. You know, it's, all of us do this, don't we? Because we just want to be seen as right. Again, it's a clue. It's a sign. Anytime you find yourself doing that, you all go, wait a minute. I actually think I'm way more concerned with being right than I am the relationship I have with the person that currently is tense. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you don't follow Jesus, you're figuring all that out. I, I don't presume to tell you what to do, okay? So you can figure out however you want to handle this. But for those of us who are Christians, here would be my question. As people who follow Jesus, how in the world, how in the world can we justify valuing being right over valuing the person on the other side of our rightness? As people who follow Jesus, how can we value being right over the person that we're not right with in a relationship? I mean, if they really are somebody that was created by God and seen as valuable by him, how can we say we follow God and not love or value his son or his daughter? Jesus talked about this in a, he talked about it a lot of different times. It was part of his core teaching. So there were these themes, there were these principles that Jesus would teach over and over and over again. And I, you know that because you find them in different places in different accounts of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four accounts touch on these themes in different ways and different places. They were, in essence, his core teaching, and wherever he went to all kinds of different crowds and all kinds of different cities, he would circle back to these themes, and he would talk about them. One of the places that are recorded is in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and we refer to them there as the Sermon on the Mount, which was a really creative title. They named it that because Jesus was on a mountain teaching a group of people. So it became the Sermon on the Mountain or the Sermon on the Mount. But in this core teaching, Jesus got right to the heart of this issue we all have, and if we're honest, this issue we all have to care more about being right than making the relationship right. And he's talking to his first century Jewish audience primarily as he's teaching this, and here was what he told them. He said, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and this needs a little context, so first century Jewish world, the most important thing to them was making sure they were right with God, okay? Okay which may sound to you like, well, yeah, of course it would be, you know. I just want to make sure everything's good between me and God. If it's good between me and God, then we're all good. But the way they had to make sure things were right with God is they would go to the temple, they would get a sacrifice, you know, a sheep, a goat, a bird, whatever they could afford, and they would make a sacrifice, and it was their way of saying, hey, God, I'm sorry for all the things I've done wrong. Now everything's good between us. And it, you know, as far as they were concerned, it worked. Well, it worked until they walked out of the temple and screwed up again because it doesn't take any of us long, does it? But, but for a minute, they felt like, okay, everything's good. So you could imagine the dilemma that would happen whenever somebody would come do this. When you realize you had to do it, you might have to travel a day or two days to Jerusalem to get there to the temple. And everybody was in the business of sinning, which meant everybody was in the business of making amends with God in first century Israel. So you didn't show up and just, you know, 10 minutes, it's like a drive through make a quick sacrifice, and you were good. No, no. You'd show up, and the temple would be packed every day. It'd be packed with people who were making these sacrifices to make amends to God. And the way it worked is, usually right outside the temple, you would buy your sacrifice, you know, whatever you needed. And then once you bought it, you would get in a line, and you would wait, and you would wait. And you would wait. This was, you know, at least an all-day affair. Sometimes it would take two or three days. You just wait and wait and wait. If you've ever been to Disney World, you know the feeling. You just wait and wait and wait, right? Two-hour line, three-hour line. That's what, that's what it was. So it would stand in line, stand in line, stand in line. They would finally, you know, get to the front and make their sacrifice, and then they'd leave and make their way back home. So this was a tedious, time-consuming process. And this is what Jesus is addressing. So he says to them, this is a bit shocking to them. He says to them, okay, let's say that you're standing in your 
Disney World line, and you're just daydreaming, waiting for your turn to do the sacrifice with the priest. You're just standing there daydreaming, and then Jesus says, and there while you're daydreaming, you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. You didn't even do anything wrong. It's just, oh, yeah, as you're sitting there daydreaming, oh, yeah, I think Joe is still frustrated with me. I don't know. I don't deserve it. I, w- I didn't do anything wrong, but he's mad at me, you know, or I think Susie's still upset and seems like there's a little tension between us. You're just daydreaming and you start thinking about these people who maybe have an issue with you. You didn't do anything. It's not really your fault. They just have an issue with you. Well, what Jesus says next to them and to us just turned their world upside down. He said, if you're daydreaming and you think of one of those relationships, I want you to leave your gift there in front of the altar. I want you to first go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift, to which they all thought, you've got to be kidding me. I am not stepping out of this line that I've been in all day, and in some cases traveling over to, you know, my hometown to try to make things right with somebody when I didn't even do anything wrong. It's all their fault. And then I got to come back and get in line again. I mean, this would take up a whole week's time. Jesus says, no, that's what I want you to do. That's what I expect you to do, to which they're thinking, that makes no sense. And this is where it connects with us. They had to have been thinking, that makes no sense because the most important thing for me is to make sure things are good between me and God. I can deal with them later, but I got to make sure things are good between me and God. And Jesus' point was, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. The most important thing is actually not to make sure things are good between you and God. It's to first go and make things good between you and the person who you have a broken relationship with because... You can't be good with God if you're not good with the people that God loves. This was Jesus' point. You can't love God well. Great, you made a sacrifice to him. He's not impressed. You can't love God well if you don't love well the people that he loves. So this flies in the face of all of us who want to avoid conflict. Well, yeah, I'm just, but I'll, I'm at church, you know, da 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 da, but I'm not going to go talk to them. Jesus goes, no, you got it backwards. You got it backwards. This flies in the face of all of us who say, well, time heals all wounds. Just give it some time. Time does not heal all wounds. You know that's true. But we all want to make excuses and justify not going because it's not easy. It's not fun. And sometimes we feel like it won't even be productive. And Jesus says, listen, you're not going to be good with God until you deal with and address the issues you have with other people. Which, one, is challenging because for many of us, let's be honest, there are relationships that come to mind right now, aren't there? People that were like, oh my gosh, I don't really want to have that conversation. But that's what Jesus would say do. He says, yeah, send the text, have the chat, stop by and have the conversation. You've got, if you know there's an issue, but I didn't do anything wrong, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. You're wasting time if you don't go and try to make things right. It doesn't matter who's at fault. When you know there's tension, you're responsible to go. Now, we could just end right there, and I could send you on your way, and none of us would really know what to do, and if you had enough courage to actually try to have these conversations, it might possibly blow up in your face. If you've had that experience, that's not fun. But Jesus isn't done teaching us. He goes on to talk about how to have these conversations. So before we wrap up, I want to show you what he says about how you approach them. If you're sitting there thinking about one that you're like, I really don't want to have this. I don't even know how I would have it. Jesus says, well, let me tell you how to approach these conversations. Just a little later in his core teaching, he said this. He said, do not judge or you too will be judged. You know what it means to judge? To judge doesn't mean, well, I think that's right or wrong. There are, obviously, there are rights and there are wrongs. No, no. When I judge you, what I'm doing is I'm attacking your character. When I judge you, it moves from the issue that's a problem to you are the problem. We've all been on the other side of that, haven't we? We know what that feels like. That's what it means to judge or condemn someone. It moves from the issue to being really, really personal. So Jesus says, all right, listen, when you go have this conversation, you make sure it doesn't become about their character. You make sure it doesn't become about the person. You make sure it remains on the issue. Well, why do I need to do that? He says, well, it's simple. In the same way you judge others, you're going to be judged. You'll get back what you give. With the measure you use, it's going to be measured to you. In other words, Just don't go dump on them. Don't go unload on them. Don't go, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're such an, if you didn't, and you always, you know, all the things that we tend to do. Because, Jesus says, you're going to have a moment in the future 
when you're going to be on the other side of this and you don't want people to unload on you. And Jesus says, by the way, you have sinned against your heavenly father and he didn't unload on you. He extended grace and mercy to you. And you're going to have a moment in the future where you're going to want his grace and mercy again. So he says, how about you go into the relationship, into the conversation, giving people what you would want if you were on the other side of it. And then he gets personal. This is where it gets tough. He goes on, he says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? Now what he's getting at here is the biggest problem all of us have, self-deception. It is. The biggest obstacle to your growth, to your relationships, to your relationship with God, your relationship with others, is your ability and my ability to deceive ourselves. Your ability and my ability to miss all the issues we have and only see the issues they have. It's your ability and my ability, when they do something wrong, I'm going to condemn you. When I do something wrong, I have an excuse or justification for it. I'm going to give myself a pass. I'm going to hold you accountable. We have all been guilty of that. And Jesus' point is, none of these conversations will go well if you do not have enough self-awareness to recognize your part of the problem, to recognize your issues that have contributed to the situation. But it is so hard to see, which is why most of us go into these conversations and our focus is entirely on what they did wrong and we don't see anything we did wrong. And it's also why Jesus got really direct in what he said next. He goes on, he says, you hypocrite, which is kind of strong, but that's true for us, isn't it? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The thing is this, that takes a lot of courage. It takes way more courage to look in the mirror and go, I did that, and I contributed there, and this is my part of the problem. It takes way more courage to do that than to look out the window and point the finger and just blame the other person. But relationships that get reconciled, conflict that ends in a healthy way, it requires that kind of courage. You can't have healthy conflict and you can't experience reconciliation without it. So, let me summarize everything Jesus just said. Because if you're sitting there thinking, I've got this conversation I need to have, if you're sitting there thinking, I don't even want to address that. If you're sitting there thinking, I don't think it would do any good. I think if I talk to them, it'd just make it worse, not better. I get all that. I've thought all that too. But Jesus just gave us a blueprint for how to do it. And he didn't make it an option for those of us who follow him. So let me just summarize what he taught. And maybe these will be three steps you can carry with you to have some of the conversations you may have to have this week. The first thing he taught us was this. Let's address, don't avoid. Let's address, don't avoid. Some of you, man, you just want to avoid conflict at all costs. And I know you've got good reasons for it, but you don't have a, a reason when it comes to what Jesus said. In spite of your past experiences and how tough it was at home, and you know, you're, you've got to address it. You can't avoid it. You can't rationalize it away. If you know there's an issue between you and somebody, talk to the person. Then secondly, Jesus said, admit, don't accuse. So own your part. Figure out what's my part in this blame pile, Okay. Because it's not all mine, and you pretty quickly know how much of it is theirs, don't you? But how about we start by looking in the mirror and admitting our part instead of just accusing them of everything they did wrong? And I'll tell you, this will change the nature of most of the conversations you have. These tense, difficult conversations, if you will start by admitting your part instead of accusing them of what they did and trying to get them to admit their part, it will change the nature of most of them. But that requires a level of humility, and that requires a level of courage, doesn't it? That is not easy for any of us. But Jesus says, let's start right here. Start with dealing with the plank in your own eye. Let's address that and talk about that first. And then maybe you can get to talking about the speck in theirs. Which leads to the final piece, which is accept, don't antagonize. And here's all I mean by that. Did you notice Jesus never said, if you do this, all of your relationships will get reconciled? Because that's not true. Nor did he say, if you do this, then they're going to respond the way you hope they respond, because that's not true. His point is this. You have a responsibility, and I have a responsibility. The responsibility is for us to do what is in our power to do. 
And all I'm responsible to do is go talk to a person when I know there's an issue, own my part, and try to reconcile. That doesn't mean it'll reconcile. And from experience, you know that too, don't you? Even if you handle this so well, even if you're so loving in the way you do it, it takes two people to reconcile. But it doesn't take two people to do what Jesus asked us to do. It only takes you. So you do your part, and then you accept the outcome. You do your part. And as Paul put it, as far as it depends on you, you can be at peace with everybody. But if they don't want to reconcile, you know what that means for you? You don't have to antagonize. And by that I mean you don't have to try to convince them or push them or persuade them to own their part. You can't control them. You just do what you know you should do. And if they respond well, wonderful. A relationship is reconciled. If they respond poorly, guess what? You're going to sleep just fine tonight. You are. Because you will go to bed knowing I did everything in my power to make peace. As far as it depended on me, I did my part. And you can move forward with a clear conscience. You can move forward peace of mind. You can move forward free of all the baggage and the emotional wear and tear that comes from knowing there are unresolved conflicts in your life. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, you can move forward knowing you have modeled for that person and you have modeled for the other people watching you exactly what Jesus has done for you. See, when he died and rose again for you, he did everything he could do on his end to make peace with you. He went 90% of the way. He went as far as he could go. But as you know, and this may be some of you, for those of you who've yet to receive that, for those of you yet to be willing to say, okay, I want to accept that gift of forgiveness, well, that's your response, and Jesus doesn't force you into that. And you and I can't force people into it as well, but we can do everything on our end, and we can model the love, the peace, the grace, the mercy, the acceptance to others, even others that don't agree with us. We can model that to them just like our Heavenly Father has extended it to us. So, are there some relationships? Are there some conversations? Are there some tensions and issues that you need to address? Jesus says, hey, get up from church, go have the conversation. You want to be good with God? Then be good with the people that God loves. Let me pray for us. Father, for those of us who are thinking of some of those conversations and scares us to death, uh, for those of us who are thinking of them and we're arguing in our head why we shouldn't do it and don't want to do it and I'm not going to do it, God, would you give us enough um, courage to be willing to address those, to do the difficult thing? But would you give us enough humility to look in the mirror first and to approach those conversations with grace and with love, with humility, to own our part and just leave in your hands their response? Jesus, thank you for modeling this for us and thank you for the extraordinary grace you show to us even when we don't deserve it. That's in your name we pray. Amen.